Um, so thank you again for speaking with us today. Uh, we've uh, heard many of your interviews and we know that The X-Files was your first job in Hollywood. And you quickly went from staff writer to executive producer. So we're super excited to hear about your memories from the show for our fan retrospective. Share with us. Um, so oh gosh, where to begin? I have so many memories because, you know, it was eight years of my life and I really, you know, uh, lived there. You know, I ate, breathed, slept X-Files. Um, it, it took over everything. I was working seven days a week, you know, long hours. Um, uh, well, I remember the, going to lunch with Chris Carter and Howard Gordon the first week I was there when I'd been hired. And I was pitching a couple ideas and, and nothing was really landing. And then I remember saying to him, what if, what if Samantha came back? What if a woman claiming to be Samantha came back? How would Mulder know it wasn't her? And I could see across the table, Chris's eyes, like widening, like I'd hit up upon something. So that was a really exciting moment. And that led to my first credit on a, a colony in, in game. Um, and I remember that, um, that two-parter being really controversial and everybody saying it was too expensive and who is this idiot that thinks we can have a submarine conning tower, you know, you should fire this guy, uh, no joke. So that was a bit stressful um, and scary. Uh, but also like Chris giving me responsibility right away. Like he sent me to the editing room. I think it was the first week, maybe it was the second week. First, second week I was there because there was the episode Excelsis Day which they were having trouble with and that, you know, they, they're trying to make it work editorially. And he just sent me in to go fix it. Um, and similarly, he just started sending me to the, to the sound mixes to go supervise the sound mixes. So he just threw me in the water to see if I could swim. And, and amazingly, um, I could, um, but it, you know, it was a very, very, uh, competitive, um, tough environment. It was really hard. You really had to give your best to survive and, you know, if you look at the credits, the writing credits, there's a lot of people who didn't didn't stick around very long. Um, but I learned so much, and um, Chris really pushed everybody to give their best, and he was so ambitious for the show, and refused to settle. And so, you know, it was really rewarding. It, it was hard, but really rewarding. Hmm. This isn't my actual next question, but it just popped in my head. How did the John Gilnitz thing come about? I know some people know that little tidbit, some people don't. How did that come about? And then you popped it in the show all the time. Well, it became a thing, you know, John and Vince and I were like a unit, you know, we hung out all the time. You know, even after work, we, we hung out. <laughs> what, what little time there was when we weren't working, we hung out. And it became a thing where we were rewriting scripts and we knew we weren't going to get any credit on these scripts. That's just the way it went. You know, there's an awful lot of rewriting of scripts on X-Files without taking credit. I, mean, I can't tell you how many Chris rewrote or in later years Vince rewrote without putting his name on it. Um, and so I don't know how we came up with the idea of creating a character who would always somehow be in these episodes that we did uncredited rewrites for. Um, I think it was on wet wire it was the first time and then we just it just became a thing that we just started putting and if you look at our three names vince gilligan john scheidman frank spot it's, it's actually very hard to find a combination <laughs> john gillis is probably the only way you could combine those three names so it was our in joke i thought it was perfect i didn't know no, for a long time i read it somewhere and i was like Oh, no, we never sense. thought anybody would ever notice so this should ever become a thing you know who knew so it's it's kind of funny and, and nice that people are even aware you can never doubt x-files fans <laughs> yeah, that's true. It all. um how hard was it to transition from the x-files to the tv show to fight the future back to the tv show and then essentially i want to believe how hard are, how hard is it to work that not only as a writer but a producer and um because you're really you're you're got to continue the story but you also have to work with a broader audience yeah um, i mean you approach fight the future was really tricky and hard to figure out because the studio said look you've got to give answers um we're going to market this you know 
campaign's going to be, you know, answers will be revealed. You've got to do it. But we were like writing it a year and a half in advance, right? We knew we were going to shoot it over the summer and then have a whole year of the TV show and then release the movie. And so we we didn't really know, you know, all the all the path we were going to take a year and a half in advance. So we said, well, we can get to the point where the X Files have been destroyed, and we'll figure out how we get there. And then we will now we have to come up with answers to a lot of these things in the mythology and put them in the movie. And it's funny looking back on it because we thought those were definitive answers, but even the movie it was like just raised more questions and more questions that people wanted to see um, addressed. But it was really like how, how to find the time to write the movie because we were doing X Files twenty four episodes and Millennium you know twenty four episodes. Millennium was supposed to be this other show that Chris created that other people ran, and that didn't happen except for you know season two when Glenn and Jim ran it. It became like our problem and challenge and opportunity as well so right. to do you know 48 hours of tv which is itself inhuman plus you know a story for the movie so um you know you probably know like we broke the story for the movie over the christmas vacation i flew out to chris's hotel in maui in hawaii and we spent a week together in his hotel room breaking the story and then he took two to three weeks off. He stayed uh, writing that script while the rest of us you know, stayed with the TV show. And then I think it was sort of like third or fourth week of January, he delivered the first draft. So it was incredibly quick for a movie of that scale um, to do it. But gosh, I mean, it was, it was so exciting and so much fun. And like things like the opening scene of that movie, you know, the snow and the reason we wanted the snow is because you know it's sort of like talking about in game and the submarine conning tower it's like we can do this in a movie you couldn't do it on a pretty show and then having the legend come up you know texas you know thousands of years ago we we knew that would be a laugh for for fans you know with watching that in a, in a movie theater so it was it was really fun and you're talking about memories to me of all the many wonderful memories i have of the x-files the best memory is opening night of that movie and and being in Grandma's Chinese Theater in Hollywood and Mulder and Scully almost kissing and not kissing and the audience screaming, literally 3,000 people screaming at the screen. Um, you know, I just, I said at the time, it will never be better than this. And what could be better than that? And, and, and to be able to watch it with an audience, which you never could do otherwise. You know, so that was really great. It's funny you say that. We spoke with a fan yesterday yeah. from our Instagram account and she met her husband because she liked the X-Files. And they took a road trip out there just to stand on the carpet and cheer you guys on. Yeah. And then you said, everyone who's here is welcome to come and screen it. And she says that after the birth of her children, that was the best moment of her life. So you definitely share that uh, sentiment with a lot of your fans. So that that's pretty cool. Um, so our next question is about being in the writer's room. In one of your interviews, you had mentioned that it was the most fun place to work because of all the infinite possibilities that were discussed. So we're wondering, what were some of those possibilities that were too outrageous but eventually made it into an episode? Do you remember anything specific? Well, and forgive me if you've heard the story before, but um, yeah, I mean, one of them was Scully getting cancer because I had said, you know, after Piper Maru and Apocrypha, we've kind of established that's what happens to these women who've been abducted, right? They, they all get cancer. And um, it was rejected by an executive who said, you know, that's kind of soap opera stuff. X-Files doesn't do that. And I go, well, it just seems like we kind of have to do that. That's what we've established. And um, I kind of lost the argument in season four and then um, Darren Morgan, who had left the show, even though he'd left, he'd said he was going to write one more script. And we were expecting his episode to come in right before the Christmas break. And we were out. We had no stories, no scripts, nothing. And what I recollect is that basically three days before his script was supposed to be turned in for us to prep, and then we were to go away for Christmas vacation, he said, uh, I, I didn't do it. I, I, I got nothing. I wasn't able to write it. We we're like, oh no, what are we going to do? And so that's when I said, well, Scully's getting cancer. You know, so I'm going to win this argument then because we got nothing. 
and and John and Vince and I broke Memento Mori in one day. Usually it takes us like two weeks to break a story. We broke that story in one day, and then the next day, we all wrote a third of the script each, and then we stitched it together. I, we didn't even read what the others had written. We just stitched it together, and we prepped it, you know, and then we went off Christmas vacation. Chris rewrote it over the Christmas vacation, which is why that script has our four names on it more than any other episode of the show, and it was the only one that we got nominated for uh, an Emmy for, for writing. So it was a really happy ending. And weirdly, it just so happened that you know it, it abutted against Leonard, Leonard Betts, who was a cancer reader. So it just it was like it was like we intended it, but we we had it, and we were able to make it fit together perfectly. Hmm. So you guys did not intend. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, the original, had, Leonard Betts, that was, that was not the ending. You have something I need. That was not the ending. Just, you know, they just killed Leonard Betts at the end. But we realized, oh, especially if you have cancer, oh, this is perfect. And then on top of that, the Super Bowl, and there was a big debate over which episode was going to be the Super Bowl episode, whether it was going to be Never Again or Memento Mori, or, or Leonard Betts, sorry. And, um, and the rest is history. Wow. Well, Momentum War is one of the most beautifully written shows of the series. I love that episode. Thanks. It's one of my favorites. Um, mm -hmm. What about the X-Files are you most proud of? Gosh. Um, I'm really, really proud of so many things. I'm proud of the, cult, the character of Scully. Um, just because looking at the legacy of that character and the influence she has had... Um, on other female characters in television, but on the real lives of young women. And that's kind of a miracle to me. You know, you invent this, I didn't create the character, but you know, I, I spent a lot of time with her in my head and um, it's, you know, it's fiction and she's fighting monsters and aliens. And yet she so inspires people who then grow up and actually do the real thing in their lives, really become scientists or doctors or and that's that's really miraculous to me. I'm really proud of that. Um, and I think you know the fact that I'm talking to you right now about the show, after all these years, is is what we dreamed of. I mean, I, I explicitly remember talking to Chris in the first year I was on the show about wanting to make television that was not disposable that people would still watch and talk about for years to come. And I'm really proud that you know people still talk about the show and they do you know and even my peers in Hollywood they still talk about the, the show it was it was an important show and I, I'm really proud of that and then I'll, I'll say one other thing about the show that I think people don't always mention I think it was a smart show and ambitious and all those things but it was a really cinematic show you know it, it really used visual storytelling and I think I give Rob Bowman and Kim Manners a huge, huge amount of credit for that and I think it helped change television because it was trying to make television into little movies, which a lot of people said, but really nobody really did. I mean, Twin Peaks before X-Files, but it was, it was pretty rare. So I think, you know, I'm really proud of the, of the legacy of the show. Ward, I'm going to jump in and just have another question. Um, sure. You participated at X-Fest. Um, we were supposed to go unfortunately my daughter was born two weeks later you can probably hear her in the background wow. uh, talking in her crib um what was it like interacting with the fans are you saying it's all these years later but these fans are coming from all over the world to see you guys what is that experience like for you well it's always amazing how smart the fans are uh and I mean, I, I was one of the few people who always went online. You know, obviously we were, we were growing up with the internet, the X-Files. We were one of the first internet shows. And I would go on the message boards in the beginning, and then I would go on the, you know, fan sites. And on X-Files, you know, Fox had it. After a few seasons, we had an official, you know, chat section. And I would go. And it was painful, I have to say, <laughs> to read the comments. Because even if, even if 100 of them were... We love this show. There would always be three or four that were like, you know, terrible. And and those are the three or four that always, you know, you felt and you remembered forever. Um, but seeing the fans in person, I was always amazed at, you know, how bright they were and how observant they were and how they didn't miss things. And there was one 
fan convention I went to in Minneapolis, and this was during the third season, and somebody said to me, one of the fans, when are you going to deal with the aftermath of Melissa's death, Scully's sister's death? And I realized, oh my God, it's true. We haven't done that. And on the flight back from Minneapolis to Los Angeles, I came up with a whole story for Piper Maru. And it was like, you know, this fan mission, this thing, and I just realized that's a ball we've dropped. And, you know, later on, I wrote the episode uh, alone as kind of a tribute to an, an explicit acknowledgement of our fans and the relationship we had with our fans, you know, the character of Layla Harrison. And you know, she kind of, she was an FBI agent, but she really was basically a fan of, of the show. And then, of course, as you know, like we literally would put handles of fans in the main titles um, toward the end of, of the, the nine-season run. So um, I, I think The X-Files was one of the first shows to have this really deep and kind of um, interactive relationship with its fans. It was really rewarding. Was Layla Harrison's character, was that the one that was named after the, the woman who uh, was a super fan who died? Yes. Um, she had cancer or something like that. Yeah, I remember yeah. reading about that. It's really cool. That was a beautiful um, tribute. You were at, a, you were at um, the X-Files Expo that I went to in 1998 wow. in New York. Um, I went with my parents because I was that cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll never, never forget it. I mean, I went into TV production because of this show. We asked this to everybody. Why do you think the X-Files is still so relevant? You touched upon it earlier that it, it reads more like a movie when you're watching it. Um, obviously, the writing and the characters are incredible, but not just fans like Carly and myself. I mean, we were kids when this premiered. I was nine. She was ten. We grew up watching it, but we're meeting people at conventions. We're talking to people online. You know, they're they're picking it up now. They're in high school. They're watching it. What do you think about the X-Files? This resonates with so many different generations. I think the first thing I've got to say is I think Chris created a perfect show. I mean, it, it, you know, the characters of Mulder and Scully, the believer skeptic, and the fact that he flipped your gender stereotype expectations on their heads by having Scully be the skeptic and the scientist and Mulder be the character of Faith. I just was a perfect storytelling vehicle and those two characters are perfect and then you know the genius and luck of casting david and jillian in those roles and they're just you know magical chemistry together and they could do everything you know they could play the sexual chemistry they could play the intelligence they could play the suspense they could play the humor in all those episodes who knew how gifted they were going to turn out to be and then i think you know on a storytelling level it's about uh, things you're afraid of, uh, but ultimately it's about hope. And I think that's kind of a, a, a timeless theme. And, and one of the things I was thinking about, you know, today actually, knowing we were talking, was, you know, one level the show we, we weren't aiming high in a way we just wanted to scare you, right? It was like you know we would call them boos, those scenes that made you jump. We, we always had to have you know at least a boo or two per act. And, you know, that's like kid stuff. It's like, you know, teenagers, like, just trying to, to scare you and make you jump in the dark. But on the other hand, the show really did try to be smart. And really, many, many episodes were about things that make you think. You know, and you look at a lot of those taglines, you know, belief, the lie, the truth is out there. Um, it, it really was an interesting combination of kind of high and low. Um, and I guess the last thing is, you know, just the weird structure of the show and that it was, you know, 14, 16 episodes a year that were standalone. They're like little movies that you can just watch pop in and out very easily. And then those mythology episodes that was sort of a precursor to the way television is today, which is all serialized pretty much, you know? Um, so, and that was just luck, you know, we, we just stumbled into that. That was not an intentional design. It was something that, the series grew into um, over the season. So a lot of reasons, I guess. Great. Lauren, do you want to do the fan? Ones? We have a fan question. Uh, feel free to say pass. <laughs> Where do you see Mulder and Scully right now? What are they up to? 
Well, I'm so confused because of the the recent uh, <laughs> the recent revival where they're back at the FBI and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I had one version in my head before those last two seasons, which didn't really match with what I thought. Um, because, you know, I, I still had Scully practicing medicine and Mulder sort of in that house, but I didn't see Mulder staying in that house. I saw Mulder being drawn back. Like, I, I couldn't sit on, on the sidelines. And I think actually, you know, right now would be a really interesting time for Mulder and Scully because um, the truth itself is so um, under attack. You know, it's kind of never been more important to get at the truth. And the thing about truth is it, it knocks down walls. You know, you get truth and it can destroy, you know, empires. The truth is, is so important and and that's, that's their ultimate cause. So um, I, I think in some way, what, whether it's with the FBI officially or not, uh, Mulder and Scully would, would still be um, fighting. If you could say something to the fans of the last 25 plus years, what would it be? Well, I would say thank you. Um, I think the most rewarding relationship I have had, and this is saying quite something, has been with the fans of the show. Um, I have had a dialogue with the fans, you know, initially just online, reading their comments. Uh, but then really since the show ended, I have been in touch with fans all over the world, literally all over the world. You know, Singapore, Hong Kong, South America, Middle East, Europe, uh, obviously America and Canada. Um, and they have given the show meaning to me. You know, when you're a storyteller, you're telling a story to someone and your satisfaction comes from having that person receive your story and feel it was rewarding. And I mean, just sitting here talking to the two of you right now, it's like, this is, it's a lot. The X-Files is a lot because we're talking about it now. And without this conversation, without you, what is it? You know, it's, it's dead film. So, uh, you know, I think that's been the greatest gift is, is the fans who still watch, think about, talk about the show to whom it still matters. And, um, you know, I, I, it's a funny thing about TV because TV, we wanted it to last as long as possible, but TV tends to expire, you know, even, even great movies, very, very few last a very long time a very small audience still watches really old movies so it's people who keep them alive um so i mean for me you know on, on a on a personal level the x-files you know started my career and i learned everything you know from doing the x-files it was my school but um it's the fans um that i would say uh, i'd say thank you to them. 